So orbit temperature has the ability to suppress and sedate or invigorate and engage. And it makes perfect sense to me that the architecture in which we spend most of our time would have this profound impact on us. And lucky for us, those of us who are architects, we're responsible for designing these spaces. We get designs and spaces that have this profound impact on us. And the, the need to do so, it requires that we understand how a design can profoundly affect us. So that brings us, of course, to the neurons. And neurons, of course, we all know there's things that, the structural unit that uh, make our brains work, to keep safe and make us walk, reason, navigate spaces, everything. And neurons enable us through synaptic fiber, uh, basically the equivalent of the brain activity. And this is key to understand architecturally because this process, it begins with a stimulus. And the neuron is sparked, it's engaged, it's electrical, excited, and in turn, it, it excites other neurons, and then others, and then others, and then others. And it starts to create these complex neural networks that um, other presenters have alluded to earlier. And these dynamic networks and neural connections, they, they can be viewed as sort of the scaffolding that shape our consciousness. And I, I say dynamic connections because Brain activity is not, it's not static. These connections are not always occurring at the same strength or in the same patterns. And, and this is important to note because it's, it's not just the number of synapses that we're interested in, it's the variety of the connections from neuron to neuron. So it's sparking new and more complex connections within and beyond specific areas of the brain. So not only does synaptic firing strengthen the neuron and the neural connection, increases the type, the pattern of neural connection. So neurons firing in certain areas of the brain and firing in conjunction with neurons in other areas of the brain can create new networks of these neural connections linking different areas of the brain. And so when thinking these complex connections, uh, as a visual person, I find it easier to think of uh, creating more three-dimensional connections. So it's not this sort of linear 2D path, it's, it's more this three-dimensional path. And um, as Dr. Gage already alluded to, with, with billions of neurons, so we have trillions of possible connection options. And this process of neuronal stimulation and firing results in this ever-evolving web of neuronal connections that, that creates our capacity for learning, creativity, adaptation, uh, but it's provided that we, we keep this network stimulated. And so this is how we can produce neuroplasticity and perhaps neurogenesis by increasing these neuronal firings and the extreme strength of these connections. And, you know, so this all begins with the neuron and, and stimulating the neuron. So the goal then is to create and optimize the stimulus. So we can essentially begin to think of architecture and designing a neurological stimulus. We can start to think of architecture as the brain as our client. And that's who we're designing for. Something that the neuroscience world has been studying since at least the 1940s when uh, famous neuroscientist Dr. Uh, Donald Hebb first started taking some of his lab rats home with him. And being the good scientist that he was, he started noting the changes in their behavior he started testing them again uh, and found that they were actually improving their uh, outcomes on these tests. And this eventually became known as the concept of enriched environment. Uh, this was the beginning of a whole range of research looking into how the environment can serve as a neurological stimulus. And so for our purposes, what is an enriched environment? So the goal of enriched environments and the newer studies now that have researched the concept very slightly from study to study, but essentially seem to boil down to improving an animal's quality of life by providing them with a combination of multi-sensory cognitive stimulation, increased physical activity, enhanced so social interaction, and by eliciting natural explorative behaviors. These environments are then held in contrast to the rudimentary or spartan environment lab animals typically get housed in, which sadly may not be too different from a typical city apartment. And as a, a brief primer on enriched environments, how they've been used, uh, for those unfamiliar with it, it consists of both physical and social enrichment. Uh, physical enrichment 
microscopic study of cancer indicators which allow remote exploration, as well as important in permitting animals some control over their environment. And a recent paper noted that the key features of enriched environments appear to be complexity and novelty. For mice, rats, and even monkeys, such improvements have taken the shape of plastic tunnels, ramps, branches, ladders, swings, wheels, uh, novel objects that encourage foraging, and even enhance more natural bedding. And the amazing thing is that changing the animal's housing, including such objects, such objects for them to uh, experience with, has had a significant effect not just on behavior, but on a whole array of measurable outcomes. Studies looking at rich environments have found positive effects on everything from improving memory to even improving stress resilience, improving motor skills and visual acuity, and improving nervous system disorders and reducing cognitive decline. Many of these findings have Many of these findings are mediated through neurogenesis as well as neuroplasticity. And this occurs in part of the brain, as has been mentioned a couple times now, uh, in hippocampus, which is associated with memory and spatial navigation. And the anatomical changes that have been found in these studies, uh, since most of the neuroscientists out there, include increases in cortical thickness, dendritic arborization, as well as uh, increasing length of dendritic spine, its synapse and size, as well as its number. And neurogenesis, in particular, has been found to occur in these experiments. And this was a particularly fascinating and surprising effect, since for a long time, as we heard about this morning, it was thought that the brain was incapable of growing new neurons after a critical period early on. It was only relatively recently that neurogenesis was found to occur in adults. And uh, as Dr. Gage noted, an important point of this research is that adult animals maintain this capacity for neurogenesis. And we see this as key. Uh, the notion that, at the very least, a capacity for neurological improvement exists for adult animals that appears to be based on environmental stimulation. Uh, however, to be able to translate this into an application for human housing, it's important to consider what the limitations of these studies have been. Uh, a major concern of researchers have been whether the effects of enriched environments are due mainly just to increased voluntary exercise. Or in terms of our proposal, why not just have people exercise more? And the research here is quite interesting, especially very recently, there have been studies that have found uh, an effect on rich environments independent of just exercise. The exercise component appears to induce actual neurogenesis, uh, the actual production of the cells themselves, whereas in rich environments have been seen to have an effect on cell survival after they've been produced, which is thought to have a greater definite control over overall neurogenesis. In other words, exercise can prime the nerve, but a stimulus is required, required to stable neurogenesis. Another potential problem to be considered is that of overstimulation or stressful stimulation. And as such, the goal for this is optimal, not maximal stimulation. And we think this is really where an architect's design sense must come into play in striking this balance. Also, thinking about whether enriched environments merely return animals back to a more naturalistic environment, a group of researchers from Italy have instead considered the fact that perhaps enriched environments imply a kind of challenge-free interaction with a stimulating surrounding, uh, prompted by a combination of both curiosity and play, and devoid of the actual stressors of the wild, uh, which might uh, change how they would otherwise uh, interact in their environment. And accordingly, these are designed these are ideas that we're hoping to echo in what we're calling genetic design. So although we've been talking about stimulating, growing, and strengthening the brain, it's important to note that the reverse of this can also be true. If you're not stimulating your brain, if it's not firing, if you're lacking in synaptic action, uh, the brain can degenerate. It's, it's a form of what we're calling automation conformity. Architecture can sedate us and, and make our actions become automatic because we're lacking options and, and, and novel ideas, novel things to engage. We can conform to the buildings we're in because they do not provide us options. They, they tell us where to look, where to travel, where to sit, where you should interact with people, where you should be alone. So how do we design to avoid this? How do we design for the stimulus, the enriched environment that will positively impact that will have a positive neurological impact on us. So, as Matt said, it's through kinetic design. And we define kinetic design 
as improving quality of life. And what well, we define it similar to uh, enriched environment as designed to improve quality of life by providing a combination of multi-sensory cognitive stimulation, increased physical activity, enhanced spatial consideration, and social interaction, and by eliciting natural exploratory behavior. And so the goal then is to tend towards an infinite number of ways to move through and engage in space physically and visually. So we're going to set up uh, a few pre-designed concepts that really elaborated on this idea. First idea is a house in New Orleans, and it is designed for a flood ravage relief season, and a lot of programmatic requirements such as being elevated eight feet off the ground. So we have an 880 square foot house with multiple inhabitants elevated off the ground, which creates a lot of design problems. Um, one of which is you're going to feel really, really constricted and confined. There's not a lot of movement options. So how do you design space that doesn't create this sense of claustrophobia? And again, the notion is create an infinite number of ways to move through a space visually and physically. So this graphic represents the multiple ways you can travel through the space. You can get to point A to point B, but you can get from point A to point B by going through C or D or F. There's multiple ways to get in and out of the space, to access the inside and outside or any room. And this is important because as you change your path, you're engaging different sensory experiences in terms of materials, in terms of light, in terms of shading, in terms of the overall experience that you have. So it keeps the space fresh and new. The same thing applies for visual cues. Whenever you're in a room, you can always see outside, and you can never see all of one room. Because that would mean that you're, you're out of options. You're just in a mundane space that, that you're sort of stuck in. I'm going to quickly move through this. We're running out of time. But this is a similar concept. Uh, it's for a treehouse that incorporated a lot of soji screens and kusama. And the purpose is to, to think about transparency, translucency, and light and space and optical features and how that can, that can affect the feel of the space. How you start to consider why and when you would want to reconfigure a space given your needs, given the environment, given how you're interacting with people. And, and this is what really got us thinking about the brain and how architecture can have an impact on the brain. And what features impact what areas of the brain. So we, we started to list off the areas that we felt were the design considerations that really could have a profound neurological impact. And we started to look at them and dissect them into more specific design considerations and the things that we felt we could incorporate into a neurologically advanced design. And to organize this, we came up with the matrix, and this is just for scale, but X access is different areas of the brain that we felt we could impact. Y access are all these design considerations people were up to see. So we would chart something like the hippocampus versus different architectural features like light and beauty and chart what areas of the brain we can affect and how. What, what architectural components can have an impact to start to consider the brain as our client. So that encourages us to, to try and translate this into a, a case study design try and take our neurological understanding and our architectural features that we think affect the brain and create, create this sort of case study design. And you can see the concept is dividing a basic law of space into public and private spaces and how can we bleed it and, and blur that line and, and always transform and, and change that space, make it operable. Going too quick there. So, well, this is a middle space. This is a, a pivotal space in design. It's a middle room, and it blocks off that private and public space. But you keep enough transparency through this uh, Louvre wood screen to see beyond, to see another space in the background, which creates this sort of sense of wonder and encourages uh, the exploratory behavior. And it, it gives you a sense that there's something beyond it. It's not just a barrier. But you can pull back these walls and start to open up this space again. You can, you can turn it from a completely enclosed space to a, a more of a semi-private space. Uh, you can further break it down and open it up to the outside and let it bleed into public spaces. You can totally reconfigure how big your private space is, how big your public space is, your access to the outside, your access to the inside. Uh, we can start to incorporate things like um, skylights with, with, with panes that we can rotate in and out to bring more light into the center of our design. We can start to reconfigure spaces so that we can frame a mirror. And depending how we've configured our walls, 
we can um, create different views that are always new and novel to us because no matter where we are, it's going to be something slightly different depending on how we configure our spaces. So, same point in the plan, just changing our perspective again. You can see how this can divide our space off and, and reconfigure our space and give it a different feel. But as we start to degenerate our space and fold back our walls, you can get a sense of how it opens up and it changes the feeling and the look and, and your focal points within the space. Uh, you can start to highlight different elements of what you're doing to the ceiling, what you're doing to the countertop to further expand in or out of the space. You can make it completely open. You can bleed it to the outside. Other con important, consider important considerations, you, you don't always have to take the wall up to the ceiling. You, you, can, you can put it on rails and slide it so you can create new views and these reveals. Um, this was in the kitchen, so we decided to get chalkboard so we can uh, start to put down different notes and uh, make it more dynamic so you can engage the space. I think we're running out of time, so I'm going to wrap up real quick. Uh, the last thing, as we're thinking about this, we thought we'd throw up a proposal in terms of how you might uh, study these. Um, Study these designs, their effect on people. Um, just briefly, what we the best form we thought we could come up with to study these would be to really base off of a uh, study that was done recently and actually edited by Dr. Gage that, that showed and looked at how exercise actually increased hippocampal size uh, in humans. And in that study, they were able to use a series of imaging with MRI imaging. Um, Psychological tests, uh, that's specifically brain uh, spatial memory tests, and actually checking serum blood levels of a protein called BDNF, which can uh, actually be known to be a mediator of neurogenesis. And by uh, running these battery tests, beginning of the experiment, and then exposing the subject to a stimulus, which in their experiment was exercise, and the study we're proposing would be uh, being exposed to an environment and then repeating these tests afterwards, after a period of a year in that study being referenced, they were able to look at the differences uh, of the stimulus and actually found a positive effect there. And so it would just be a matter of finding a proper environment, perhaps a college environment using uh, the known uh, lab mice of the adult world, undergraduate students, or perhaps even in um, maybe a retirement community where people are um, very easily controlled in terms of um, just having a large community of people to be analyzed in similar settings. And what you'd have to do, obviously, would be have people in settings that incorporate these events, the, I'm sorry, incorporate these elements versus settings that seem to be completely deprived of these elements. And I think I'll just leave it there for a sake of time. So well, the point we're trying to make was that um, the base comment that shape our buildings more accurately shape our space was one of the, one of the points we were trying to make was an understanding of the human body and that we can shape our buildings so that they accurately shape us to feel like that we're in the same environment. So thank you very much for listening.